Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the sixth seminar in, or webinar, sorry, in our series. Um, today will be presented by Joyner Martinez on sample preparation basics. So just as a reminder, or um, for those who this is their first webinar, if you have any questions throughout uh, the presentation for Joyner, please put them in the chat box and I will be keeping track of all the questions that come in. Then at the end of the presentation, we'll give Joyner um, some time to answer a few of the questions. And if we don't have time to answer all the questions that come in, we'll post a second video on our YouTube channel uh, where he will answer those questions. Um, as a reminder, this is being recorded and all of our webinars will be placed on our YouTube channel and you can check out ones that are already there. Um, also, if you're having any um, difficulties, technical difficulties, uh, just let me know in the chat and I can do my best to help you out or at least uh, give you guidance where you can go to get help. And then just stick around till the end of the webinar. There are a few more announcements about some upcoming events that we will be having at the, or well, as part of the CCEM. Uh, so Joyner, I'll give it to you to start the presentation. Good morning, everyone. I hope everybody's doing well. Um, it's a nice gloomy day here in my headquarters, perfect for a webinar. And I wanna give a shout out to all my teammates over at the CCM for their webinars, they have been great. Um, and without further ado, um, today's topic, of course, as Sam mentioned, is about sample preparation. Now, this is a more introduction, introduction to the topic. So for those who are a little bit more advanced, I hope this is just a, a review for you. And for those who are newcomers, I hope that you learn a lot from, from this webinar today. Okay, so let's get started. Uh oh. Sorry about that, everyone. There we go. So, for today's lecture topics, uh, I'm going to give a little bit of a background on why it's important to do sample preparation and some of the questions that we should ask about how to approach sample preparation and how do we come about finding the right techniques, right? We have to ask a couple of questions to, to understand where the sample comes from, right? Because everything that we're going to do in terms of preparation will depend on just the sample entirely. And, and I'll give you some tips on what to think about in, in order to put it in the, right, uh, in the right microscope or for the appropriate application. In terms of experimentation, I'm going to show you how to handle the sample. I'm going to show you some tips on how to cut it, how to mount it. And especially, I'm going to talk a little bit about coding. Coding is extremely important in terms of preparation, especially for electron microscopy preparation. Well, I'm going to talk about a, a little bit about grinding and polishing basics, which are extremely important. And one topic that I don't see being used a lot in, um, in microscopy, well, I know that microscopy is used a lot, but um, I know that in sample preparation, not a lot of people tend to understand that the use of light microscopy is really important. So I'll be talking about some of those tools there that are available. And then to finish it off, I'll just be showing you uh, all of the combination of all these things that you're learning in terms of experimentations in the background of the sample to prepare some samples for SEM and TEM. So, to start off, I just want to make sure that everybody understands that there's a rule. Sample, some sort of preparation, even if it's something as basic as putting tape on a stub, an aluminum stub, just to mount it on the holder for the SEM, or just cutting the sample, is also preparation. And our first rule that I want to make sure that everyone knows is we have to wear gloves, okay? Your hands are full of bacteria, full of dirt and oils, water especially remember we're going to put our samples in very harsh environments so we want to make sure that they're dry right and other gunk this will for sure contaminate your surface it will affect results so just having a very clean environment is a good way to start and it starts with your hands right especially with everything that's going on around us these days i think that that goes without a saying without saying you should always wear gloves when handling samples for any type of microscopy in general and as a little tip for everyone just, just get familiar with your environment, right? You have to get familiar with your lab, especially if you're a newcomer at that lab, and you, got, you, you wanna make sure that you get your own tool set for that sample prep, or if you have a technician helping you, see if you can write those techniques that that technician will, will show you. Because 
every technician is different. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, obviously, the proper use of lab equipment, protective equipment is extremely important, right? And always keeping good notation. Good, good keeping is huge. And of course, my favorite at the bottom, you have to be very, very patient, okay? Sample preparation requires a lot of repetition and attention to detail, which you'll see later. Now, why do we prepare samples? Well, of course, we wanna preserve as much of the sample as possible. As you can see here on my picture to your left, right? What I did here is we had a, a pipe that we had to look at. And what I did was uh, I broke a piece of the pipe, but then later on, I figured that, okay, well, we wanna look at what's underneath this, right? So what I did is I grabbed a piece of double-sided tape and I took off some of that residue on the top and then mounted it. That way we could see the layer in between. So that's what I mean that sometimes we need to make sure that we keep that area of interest because we never know what the customer is gonna ask, right? We wanna prepare the sample for those electron, electron microscopy environments, right? We wanna protect our sample, right? The co our sample coating is a good example of that, right? We can, we, by just adding a coating, we can just add a protective layer to the sample, right? Aside from providing that conductive um, properties that we really need in terms of dealing with an e-beam. Uh, we want to see the sample at its most natural state, right? Zero contaminants, impurity free, that's what we prepare, right? We wanna keep as much of it as possible, right? I don't wanna throw this out, right? I wanna make sure that the customer has had all of the questions answered before I can get rid of it. Um, in terms of FIB, right? Sometimes it's a good understanding that FIB is really expensive and a lot of customers will wanna look for, for an easier way out. Now, how do I want to approach preparation today? Right, I just wanna show you that, you know, what is it that we wanna know about the sample, right? That's one of the questions that you should ask when you come in and let's say you're, you're seeing a technician at the CCM and you're, hey, I wanna prepare this. I want you to ask questions about the sample. Why do I need to go into the TEM, right? Why TEM, why SEM, right? What instruments do you have available at your suite, right? Luckily for us at the CCM, we have a lot, but not a lot of other labs do, right? How much time do we have to prepare the sample? I think this part of timing is a huge aspect, um, just in terms of uh, customer satisfaction as well as, as just making sure that you prepare the sample correctly, right? And every sample, like I said, I wanna emphasize that will require some sort of preparation, right? Here, I'm just showing a little bit of example of a wedge polish sample that I prepared for TM. Now, this is just a, a silicon wafer that was, um, polished at around two degrees on the wedge. So I was able to see the fringes down here, and then later on, I ion milled that middle piece there. So you can see here, mounting this to this three millimeter diameter molly ring is, is a pain, but you know, as like I said, timing is huge. Um, another thing that I think everyone should keep track of as they're coming in to prepare the sample is, what is this origin of the sample that joiner means? Okay. Well, if you know that the sample is a polymer, a metal, a, a, you know, later you'll start to narrow down your options, right? What do we, what do I need to do to the sample to make sure that it goes into the right microscope, right? And us as good technicians, as good sample prep technicians, we don't always necessarily tell them, hey, we can't do it, okay? That's what I mean by other recommendations is collaboration between labs is important. Right, so if we can't find the answer for you or that person at that lab can't, ask them where can you go in order to, to find the answers that you need, right? One big question is, do I have the right microscope, right? What if you don't have it, right? And the person just across the street has it, okay? Just make sure you let them know, hey, I can't do that sort of microscopy here, but the person across the street has so-and-so instrument and they can help you out, okay? to keep in mind as well when you're talking about that sample origin, and I already mentioned some of these points before, is the sample conductive? Am I gonna need to add a conductive layer? If it's a metal, you, you might be able to live with it and a little bit of charging if you have it mounted on a plastic or, or bakelite and, or some sort of other mount that, that is not conductive. And also you wanna ask about the composition of the sample. How is that surface? Is it really rough? Can I look at it as is? Now, if you're looking at, if you're planning to do a photography, then you pretty much have to put the sample as is. But if you want to look at the most natural state of the sample, you have to polish it. Or in other words, you have to prepare it. What instrument is that going to be analyzed in, right? 
I need to probably measure the size of the sample to make sure that it fits in that chamber. Of course, with TEMs, you won't, you don't have that much limitation, right? You're limited to that three millimeter standard size of the holders. But for SCM, it, it also depends on the chamber, right? So I recommend everyone, before you start to, sum, to summarize the path of sample preparation, have a good highlight of where that sample is gonna go into, right? And again, some samples just require simple prep, just like mounting or cutting. Now, another thing that I wanna highlight as well is outgassing of samples, right? For example, in bone. Now, I wanna say that I'm not gonna to talk too much about biological samples today, but a lot of the applications of sample prep that I'll be showing today, you can use by taking the proper um, safety precautions, I'm gonna say, okay? So at the end of the lecture today, I have a reference that is very good for biological preparation because I won't be covering it too much here. Um, but just to add to this point, some samples were required a, a reasonable pump time in these instruments so that you will be able to look at them. So for example, if you had something that's mounted on Bakelite, I know some Bakelite has some really bad contaminants there for some, some SEM vacuum. So if you have a low, uh, if you have a variable pressure SEM, or low pressure or low variable pressure SEM or environmental SEM uh, or liquid holders, you might be able to get away with some wet samples or, or insulating samples or sensitive samples. But I just want you to keep in mind that those, those, these types of equipment is extremely expensive and not everyone can get, can get to. So I wanna highlight that there are some limitations as well to, to having wet samples and especially in conventional SEM and, and TEM where you need these extra features like the liquid holders for the TMs to be able to look at them. And again, this is just an introductory lecture. So only a few sample preparation techniques will be talked about in detail. You uh, probably wonder, well, Joyner, all of this beforehand, right? All of this before talk, well, what sort of techniques out there? Well, this is just a few here on your screen, okay? We have microtomy, right? Which inv involves the thin slicing uh, of materials that are polymer base, insulating base, so it uses a diamond. Dehydration, obviously the, bi the biological people might know that a little bit better, okay? Cryofracture, that involves the freezing of the sample to a very, very low temperature in order to fracture it, to keep all of the sample intact, right? We have grinding and polishing, mounting, cutting, fracturing, chemical etching, which I'm, I'm sure metallographers love. We got ion beam, um, and be milling, plasma cleaning, fixation, coating, staining, wedge polishing, fib, APT, which Brian talked about a lot, and dimple grinding. Okay. Um, the techniques that I'll be covering today will be mount cutting, powder preparation, which is another one. Or in, uh, to be more specific, I'm going to be talking about loose powder preparation, grinding and polishing, dimple grinding, and ion beam milling. Now, some of the equipment that you need, right, because you gotta get familiar with your lab before you can begin to prepare samples, is gloves, alcohol, especially for TEM, you wanna make sure that you have the high purity alcohols to make sure that you get, that you get as, as much clean of a surface as you can. Um, I usually, mo uh, we usually use methanol for HP, HP methanol for TEM samples. Acetone, ethanol is usually the standard for, for surface cleaning. Now, it's important that you know that if you are gonna use acetone to clean your samples or you're gonna put your sample in an ultrasonic bath to clean with acetone, it's important to rinse it afterwards because the acetone tends, tends to leave a film. You want micro microscopy slides, glass slides, which are extremely useful. Let's say you wanted to cleave something, I tend to use glass slides as sort of a base to cleave uh, like a silicon wafer time to time or something. Uh, like a semiconductor, uh, razor blades, again, for cleaving, hacksaw, let's say you wanted to make more rougher cuts to a sample, wooden toothpicks, I'll show you one application of wooden toothpicks. Sometimes I use them to um, create conductive paths or glue some samples to the aluminum stubs, which can go into the SEMs. Um, surgical and regular scissors, of course, small paint brushes, which come in hand with those conductive paints that I talked about. Diamond knives, again, for cleaving or for making marks on your sample, important. Uh, conducted tapes and paints, just to reemphasize, some, you can use some paints just to mark your samples. It doesn't have to be conductive, or you can use the conductive paints and tapes for that extra bit of a protective layer to your sample. And then the mounting stuffs and bolts, right? 
And again, on the bottom there, if you have your own two sets, I want to talk about a little bit of cut of cutting and sectioning, right? Because we need to keep in mind that you know this the sample has to fit certain holders and certain chambers, right? So we got to keep that in mind. What's the standard size, right? We're going to go to the technician. In this case, let's say you're going up to Chris and you ask Chris, Chris, uh, what's the size of the SM that I need to cut? He'll let you know. You'll have to make sure that we cut it. What's the interest area that you want to cut, right? You you want to make sure that you don't want to cut and you know right across that grain boundary that, what, that you wanted to look at, right? How much of the sample do we really need for our experiment? We don't want to use it all, right? We can tell the customer, hey, you can just send me this much. Also, the material that you have, right? You want to know what sort of cutting material you need to use for that um, sort of specimen, right? For example, high concentration blade is used for harder materials. Right? You want to know what type of blade you have so you know the safety hazard behind it. And also to protect your sample. Right? As I mentioned earlier, if you want a very rough cut, you can just use a hacksaw or you can just use one of our nice equipment instruments here, like the slow speed saw, which gives you a nice precise cut because it has a nice micrometer there. And you can use the, um, the blades appropriately. Right? So cutting speed for every sample is different. Right? Some samples are very hard to cut and may take a very long time. Right, like marinitic steels and zirconium. Okay, cutting with lubrication is key, just to maintain the sample clean and also to make sure that we don't add any extra impurities. Right, you can cut with some alcohols, or if you do a more rougher cuts on a sectioning machine, make sure that you use the appropriate lubricant. Right, some examples of cutting blades are brass, quartz, aluminum oxide, diamond, and so on. Now, another topic I want to push to you very quickly is obtaining a flat surface, okay? It is extremely important to, um, to have a flat surface, especially when you're dealing with um, electron microscopy. Okay? Um, there is a tool called the lapping tool. So this tool here allows us to create a flat surface by mounting a sample right on this plate here, right? It is very easy to mount, right? You just need a piece of tape or you can use wax on a hot plate, right? And it has a micrometer to it, so what happens is measuring the depth um, allows you to see how much you want to remove. Um, the outside layer here is made out of a harder steel, which allows, you know, to maintain edge retention on the sample. Um, and also, because of the micrometer, we, we can get very precise, right? I was able to thin down samples to like about 45 microns using this tool, which is extremely thin for for a sample for a tool that is really heavy as well um the downside to this tool as well is it's very expensive right so usually you'll be spending a long time preparing samples when you want to flatten them because you have to find you know the proper mounting tool first but with the lapping tool you'll save yourself the time um, you can use this to polish as well right so what you do is you mount your steel or your aluminum piece here or whatever it is that you're trying to prepare and you polish through your grinding steps and your polishing steps. And then as you're finishing off, you take it off, clean it, and then mount it in the appropriate holder for the application SEM. Or, or if you're going to do TEM, right, because this tool is what I use to, to thin down aluminum, which uh, the TEM technique that I'll be showing later, and then punch the sample into the three millimeter discs and then place on the appropriate holder for the TEM. Okay, now we move on into sample handling. Um, on another topic of sample handling, sorry, mounting. As you can see here, right, we have epoxy, bakelite, aluminum stubs, which are the ones up here, conductive tapes, right? Let's say you just wanted to prepare a sample extremely quickly, you can just tape the sides, right? And you have a conductive layer across the sample because we want to make sure that the sample has a conductive path to ground, right? That's what the mounts are used and the tapes and the, and the paints. The inserts can be used as markings. Um, one tip that I want to give everyone is if you mount your plastics on while you when you, while using a vacuum, it gives you an extremely clean um, mount, as you see here, and it allows you to see exactly where the sample is, which I think is huge, and you can mark the sample better that way as well. But at the same time, you know, create you know getting rid of those bubbles that could uh, add to uh, contamination to the surface right you don't have to clean the surface as much as long as you give it an alcohol rinse you'll be okay 
Um, just to give you a little insight of what happened here on the, on the left side, what I did here is I mounted some particles that were uh, on a liquid, on an alcohol. And what I did is I added a little bit of conductive paint underneath and I added some droplets of the, of the, of this, of the sample. And what I did then is I let, it, let it, I, I let it dry so that then the sample can just sit on the surface and then later looked at. Now you don't have to add the paint. Um, you could have just polished the, the surface of the stub and mounted the sample, um, placed the droplet right on the surface of the, of the stub and just let it dry. You could also do that. But I figured just adding a little bit of paint underneath wouldn't, wouldn't be so bad. Now, you always have to keep in mind the size of the mold that you want to use as well. Okay. And also what type of equipment you want to use for preparing the samples, right? Um, you can also mount samples together. So here are some tips, right? So you want to add a sheet of metal on the top, right? That would be good for some edge retention, right? So the samples in orange. Right, you can mount a lot of samples together, right? It's very thin, so you can maintain the property. Or you can add a little bit of quadrant to, to, for flatness and edge retention, as you see here by, by these up here, right? Some samples can be extremely thin and hard to handle, so we have some clips as well to, to help with the mounting, right? So you would add the clips, double sided tape on the bottom and then place the plastic or the epoxy and the big light right on top of it, make sure that the sample is nice and secure. Now, I would recommend adding metallic inserts rather than the plastics, so then that, will, that way you don't have to add any extra conductive uh, coating or conductive paint, right? Also, you can add um, particles, metallic particles to these mounts so that you can just have a completely conductive uh, mount and not have to worry about coating them afterwards. But if you are going to be doing any chemical analysis, please be aware of the material that you have added to your specimen, right? In terms of coating or in terms of uh, the particles that you added to your mount, right? So let's say you combine your epoxy with a nickel powder. You want to make sure that you keep in mind that now you have nickel in your surface. Now, in terms of coating, what do we want to coat, right? We know that our samples are going to be exposed to those harsh environments, right? So we want to make sure that we add a thin coating, right, to retain those sample features, okay? And I have an example here of a coder. This is our carbon coder. You can see there is a vacuum, right? And here's the little assembly. I'll explain that a little bit further. But I just want to make sure that you know that we have all these types of coating. We have gold, palladium. We have gold, platinum, iridium, carbon, silver, chromium, okay? Keep in mind that you want to code based on your application, which I'll talk about in the next slide. But I, I just want you to keep in mind that there is a background to why we choose what coding for, okay? Um, another reason why we code is thermal conductivity, right? We want to increase, right, the signals that, we, that we're looking for, right? The secondary and the backscatter signals, that, that's one positive um, of conductive. And we also add a protective layer, right? Some of that coating is going to take some of that heat coming from our guns, protecting our sample, right? It will also help you with imaging, of course, right? Some operations, right? If you're experiencing charging, you might want to take out your sample from the SEM and TEM and consider a coating. Types of coders. Gold, right? We have a gold sputtering system at the CCM. We have about four types of coders at the CCM. And I want to talk about just these three types, okay? Um, I want to give a little background about them. So sputtering coating involves exposing the metal target of choice and the sample to an ergon plasma or xenon. The target then is eroded by the plasma and the atoms are ejected, right? And some residual gas ends up on the surface of the sample, creating a very thin uniform layer, okay? Usually the coating time takes, uh, takes about 20 to 30 seconds right, depending on, on the application, right? Now, for our vacuum evaporator, which is completely different, different, right, we have a sub-atmospheric pressure environment, and the target is under tension, so we have a good example here. So we have the two graphite, we have one that's sharp, and the other one that's more of a, like an angle directing the evaporation downwards, right? So it will be sitting up here, 
directing the coding downwards. Right, these two are under tension and we pass the voltage right through, creating heat, therefore evaporating the carbon on the surface. Okay, usually you have to make sure that you have a very clean vacuum here. Okay, so making sure that you clean the outside of your of your chamber so often is important. So usually the, the evaporator coders are usually carbon-based. Um, another type of coder out there is the ion beam, an ion beam coder, so a PEX, right? A very high quality code, right? It codes in an inline style, so whatever the direction um, of, of the gun is, right? So if you angle the target, right? You'll be able to direct the coding to it, right? And it's also done under a very high vacuum. Now, the only downside to, to, the, to the IMB encoders is they're very expensive, okay? Now, if you want extra help with these coders, I recommend everyone add a thickness monitor to these because that way it will give you a very, um, a much better understanding of why coding is important, which is my next slide, right? Because we want to code in terms of granularity as well, right? We want to make sure that we only put in the amount of coding that we really require, okay? So this little table here on your left, right, will give you some coding ideas. Coding with carbon, gold, gold and platinum, right? So if you wanna do some SEM imaging, you should consider coding with these just because they're so, so small and more general use, right? We're, we're not going into very high magnifications usually, in SCM, so you can consider gold up to about 30,000 times, right? If you're considering about doing backscatter imaging, right? Carbon, or again, we're still in that SCM, conventional SCM area, so we might be okay up to 30,000 times, but then that gold starts to get too big, right? And we, we'll, we'll have to start to consider something else that we don't wanna see when we, you know, magnify our micro 50,000 times, right? So that's when we start to get into the TEM area, the platinum, chromium, right, aluminum, right? We make sure that we code as well based on our, on our environmental analysis, right? We don't want to code with something that we're looking for, right, in our EDS analysis. But we don't want to code, well, if you're, if you're worried about magnetic domain, carbon is pretty much the only thing that you can, you can use for in terms of coding. So the entire point of this slide here is to make sure that you keep in mind that you will start to see your coding at certain magnifications. And it's really important that you know where to go in terms of granularity. Now, I'm gonna to start to talk about the expectation aspect of sample prep. And one about it is, as I mentioned earlier, we wanna obtain a flat surface, right? But a good way of doing this is just as basic sample, uh, grinding and polishing. So have you ever done any grinding and polishing? Then this is case for you, so bear with me. Um, the sample usually goes through a series of grinding steps, right? Let's say I put it on my lapping tool and I'm grinding my sample down, right? I will start off, let's say if I have a steel and I know that uh, the previous person has done, you know, a hacksaw to cut it, then I will start off something very aggressive to sort of get a smooth surface, but if you know that something else has, has been done to the sample, you can just start at, at, the, at the more higher end grids of the papers. So usually, let's say if I have um, a piece of metal, let's say a piece of steel, and I wanna start grinding it, I usually start at about 240 for like about a minute and go down. Um, now, there is finer grades for, for, the, for the papers, uh, but I didn't include them here because um, you can, I kind of see an overlap in between the grain size for some of the polishing steps. So we go, you know, 400 and 600 and 800 grid. You can go 1200 SIC US grid, but you can also just continue a six micron diamond suspension or paste, and you will probably get the same particle size uh, of, of polishing and grinding. So I just you to keep in mind that after 800 grid, you can just move on to your polishing cloths, okay? Please, please note, you have to make sure that you clean your samples after every grinding and polishing steps to avoid over, over, avoiding cross-contamination between the samples, right? So the worst thing that can happen and the worst thing that has happened to every person that has ever done any sample prep is 
you have accidentally mixed your six micron diamond with a three micron uh, diamond cloth, right? Some of those particles got in there and all of a sudden you go into your light microscope to check because that's what I wanna make sure that you do as well is after every grinding steps, you go and you look at a light microscope and you check your scratches, you check your directions, right? You wanna make sure that you're polishing well. And let's say all of a sudden you're at one micron and you start to see six micron um, you know, scratches on your sample, you have to go back, right? So it's important that you clean, and I recommend more ultrasonically cleaning it, right? In solvent baths, to, right, after every step. Now, in the grinding is not so important, but I definitely recommend it in the polishing steps in the diamond, the diamond, the diamond paste, right? So again, label every cloth to make sure that you don't make any mistake, right? And for finishing steps, after your six, three, and one micron, right? We want to go into our slurries or our, or as I call that, just our polishing, right? So I go grinding, polishing, and then I say final polishing for the finishing steps. And usually these are, you know, submicron, and you can do this depending on your application. So usually about 300 milliliters of colloidal silica for about five minutes after one micron should give you a nice mirror finish, right? But obviously some samples are dependent on, you know, obviously sample dependent. Sometimes if you want to highlight, you know, some aspects of your sample, you might want to add like a, an etch into to your colloidal silica or your slurry, just so that you can see some extra features in the light microscopes when you go and check it, okay? So for example, you for a mineral, right? You can use that as a final polishing as well. If uh, you can use that instead, uh, sorry, for a mineral, you can use alumina instead of colloidal silica just to make sure that you don't, you know, you don't over contaminate or, or add an extra etching effect because the colloidal silica, I feel that like has a little bit of, of a basic unit to it. But there is something that out there that there is machines out there that will help us with grinding and polishing, guys. We don't have to use, do this all by hand, right? So we have some grinding and polishing equipment here on my left, right? An automatic polisher. If you've ever done any grinding and polishing, you know what this, this machine does, right? The useful, and I think the most uh, powerful aspect of these machines is that we can use, do more than one sample at a time, right? We don't have to do it by hand, of course, and it allows us to, to be more precise, right? Flatter, cleaner, right? The vibratory polisher, I think, is a huge tool to make sure that you, um, I would use a vibratory polisher after I final, I final polishing steps, because let's say you're preparing samples for EVSD, you need a perfect surface, right? An almost perfect surface, okay? And in order to do that, we sort of have to um, polish the sample very slowly, very calmly, and as humans, I don't think we can do that. So I think the vibratory machine here allows us to do that very, very well. So the way that this works is, right, we add the colloidal silica or the slurry up on the top, right, and we, set up the machine to vibrate. Usually I put it to a, about level three and the machine, because the holders have a little weight to them, right? It allows the sample to rotate due to the vibration, right? Polishing at the same time, right? Usually I would say after about two, three hours, uh, you will have a perfectly polished surface, right? Assuming that you don't have any of the previous polishing steps in it. Um, now, it's important as well to make sure that you clean your sample after this, okay? Just to make sure you don't over contaminate your surface, okay? Now, on the way here, this machine is the web polisher. It's another polishing machine, okay, to help us prepare TM samples, okay, which involves having an angle by this arm here, right, which is parallel to the rotation surface, uh, the, the rotation of the plate here, right? Uh, by adding this angle, we're decreasing the size of the wedge, right? And at that angle, we're adding those fringes or those, and uh, will become thin enough for electron microscopy, okay? Now, like I was emphasizing before, the use of light microscopy is important. And I wanna emphasize three, met three modes here that have helped me um, when I'm preparing samples. Right, so bright field, which is the conventional way of looking at a sample. 
produces bright light, right, on a flat surface, and then the not the non-flat surfing features will stand out, right? They'll be they'll be darker because the, the light is reflected on an angle, right? Like pores, edges, and grain boundaries, right? Dark field is the opposite of bright field. Again, dark background and the non-flat features, like the pores or the edge grain boundaries, will look brighter, right? And then one useful one that is extremely important that I use when I'm preparing EBSD samples because you know you want to make sure that there is no scratches that are going to interfere with our signals, right? So I use DIC, right? And the way that DIC uses that normarski uh, prism <laughs> along with a polarized, pol well, along with a polarizer and 90 degrees uh, cross positions, the two light beams are are made to coincide at the focal plane of the objective, rendering the height differences visible variations in color. So whatever you see will stand out in a different color. It might be a scratch, or you'll start to see that topography stand out a lot more on your sample, which, which might show you something or might give you an idea of what's going on on the surface of that sample, okay? So light microscopy is just a great tool to ask further questions about your results and where to go next, right? So we polish, right? We're grinding, right? We're considering coding, right? SEM technique, right? So we're going to put all these things that I just talked about and we're going to um, apply them. And the, the sample preparation technique that I want to show today is loose powders. So what we're going to do is we're going to separate our powder. Let's say in this case, I'm separating, let's say, grains of gold or uh, uh, some loose powders of gold. Um, we want to separate the powders. Okay? We don't want to use it all. Okay, because we want to avoid clustering, right? So if you can filter them in some sort of alcohol, it's better to do that. But for purposes, you separate about three grams of the powder, right, into a, a weight tray. And then what I want to use to so, a sort of a binder is carbon paste, right? So propanol is a little lubrication to, so I can mix my powders in, right? I'm going to mix it until it's and glue-like, now I wanna emphasize glue-like a little bit, okay? Because you don't want it to be too sticky, you want it a little bit grainy, but you wanna make sure that it, it sits in this area very well, okay? Now, in my pictures down here, okay, you can see you have a height protruding here, we don't want that, okay? So we wanna make sure that we sort of remove this excess material because we wanna grind right on the, on the block, okay? So the block here, is graphite block that I've sectioned, I cut a piece of it, and this is my mixture or my powder. Paste the powder in, stuff it in, let me make sure that I get as flat as possible, and then if I can't achieve flatness very well by hand, I'm gonna use a little bit of my grinding tools to sort of grind that excess piece off, and you can see this is where the polishing will happen. Please, you want to make sure that you cut the graphite block into the size that it requires for the machine. So in this case, we'll be putting it in the cross-sectional polisher, okay? Usually, you can get away with a sample about half a millimeter thick by about, I would say, a millimeter, uh, I would say half a millimeter in height, um, okay? Again, I already said we want to make sure that we get any get rid of any extra material on the surface because we want to make sure the surface is flat, right? In the cross-sectional polisher, if you don't have any flatness, everything's going to be a mess. Okay. What happens here is we will put it into this machine, right? You can see the end result here by this little picture. Um, we want to make sure we align everything before we go in, right? We don't want to remove too much of the material, so the machine usually comes with with a map of how much to remove. We usually remove about four microns. No, we usually go about 40 microns in depth um, from the top. And in terms of how deep we want to mill, that depends. Now, in this powder, is not so crucial because let's say if I was using this cross section and this was my powder, I could look at the powder here, 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 here. 
any area down the cross section that we just made. Okay, that's the good thing about the loose powder method. But let's say you were doing um, a cross section on a steel and you wanted to make sure that the edge wanted to be maintained very well, we could add a shield, right? You can add a shield to protect that surface to prevent further curtaining, right? Because the, the Aragon beam is gonna make effects as you can see here. Hopefully you can see some roughness there, right? We can add epoxy as well or a silicon wafer, right? Which will allow the specimen to be protected. And again, let's say you had you know, let's say you deposited a layer of something and you wanted to make sure you retain it. I really, really highly recommend adding a shield. Okay. Now gun voltage and timing of the mill depends on the sample. So let's say I was doing the powder, usually because they're very soft and it's just carbon, it's a graphite block, usually about four to five hours would do it at around four KV. But let's say you were doing a steel, let's say you're doing a more acidic steel, you're looking at maybe 13, 14 hours in microsectional polish, okay? Multiple runs may be required. Let's say after the first run, you see that your surface is too rough and you can run around there. Let's say you didn't add a shield, you might have to continue to just mill, uh, but do it at a sort of lighter dosage. So maybe instead of doing four kV, right, go down to two kV and minimize your time by half. And then if you have to add a third run, then minimize your time again by half. Obviously, we want to check our sample, okay? Check your sample before, before it goes into the light microscope. Because you want to make sure that your curtaining is not too great. And also, you want to make sure that you didn't go too deep, right? Because if you, if you went too, too, too deep, right, you might have to um, work the field in the SEM or the TM, okay? Only downside to this method is the polishing units are very expensive. So CP polishers can be very expensive, but they're extremely useful. If you ever needed to um, look at cross sections and perform EBSD on metals, I recommend using CP polishing. It will give you a very quick, I say quick because once you polish it and you find the right method, you can just pop it into the SEM and you can probably get a a, a recent pattern for EBSD very quickly. Now that concludes the SEM prep there. Okay, so after this, you would probably put your sample in the SEM after checking it and see if it works out. Obviously, you would have to prepare it further as I taught you earlier, right? Nickel paint, mount it into the, to the proper mount for the SEM, right? Make sure that you add your conductive layer. And if it's a coating, right? You might wanna consider a coating. Now, I wanna talk about a TM prep, right? So as you can see here, right? Let's say we wanna do metals and alloys, right? We're gonna mount in our lapping tool, right? And we're gonna start our standard grinding and polishing steps because we need flat surfaces, right? I recommend doing both sides. So let's say you had a one millimeter piece of your steel. I recommend sectioning it in half, you know, half 500 microns and 500 microns. Or if you can tell your customer, can you give it to me at least 300 microns thin? That will help you, okay? Because you're gonna be thinning it to about 80 microns to 100 microns, okay? Then this, that's the standard size that you wanna get it to before you can start considering punching. Because these punching tools, now you can see one here, th this is a small one. Other companies have ones with a little bit more of, of a um, lever where you can just press the lever and the tool will come and punch. Um, but this one here is a more manual piece. So you can see the thickness. You don't want to ruin this tool. So the thickness is extremely important. You want to punch that three millimeter piece that you can see here. Okay. But don't remember, don't forget your rules, right? You don't want to throw out the sample. Okay. So what happened to, to us at the CCM is, right, we kept the sample. The customer came over and said, I want to look at this area. Okay. So it's important that we keep it. We have at the area afterwards, okay? Just because I punched this three doesn't mean I'm gonna get rid of it, okay? Not just yet. Now, if you're looking for site-specific work, I wanna emphasize this really, really thoroughly because sometimes, you know, you're talking to a customer and you tell them, 
hey, I can't target that game, that grain boundary by mechanical work, okay? You need FIB, okay? FIB is very expensive. It's understandable that some people might not want to look at that option, but please know that it's extremely difficult to target a grain boundary or something, or just target a specific site, okay? So consider FIB or wedge polishing, okay? Wedge polishing, you can probably get away with it in terms of making a sandwich, okay? So hopefully we can talk about EM preparation a little bit further. So let's say you're making a, um, a wedge and you're looking at the cross section of that wedge, right? If you make, if you're sandwiching those, right? And looking at, let's say they, they, they added a nano bond, right? By doing that wedge polishing, you can probably look at that intersection very well. The preparation has to be almost perfect. So wedge polishing is one of those, those techniques that a lot of people just consider artwork. So if you're looking for site specific work, just know there's a lot of work ahead. So if you're not willing to spend that little bit of extra money or getting or worrying about, you know, the timing of it, because wedge polishing might take a very long time. So you might have to sacrifice a little bit of quality over quantity or over price. Okay. A good tip after you punch your samples, right? Because we grinded them, right? Your last step you want to do is 600 grid, right? If you make it, if you go a little bit finer in the grid, that's okay. Remember, we want a good surface. It does not matter. It's just going to add, you know, a little bit of cleanness to it. That's not bad to do. Okay. Also, after punching it, you can also pass the sample, okay, with your fingertip, okay, for 20 seconds through a 200 grid, uh, 1200 grid, okay, silicon carbide, with a little bit, maybe like a drop of isopropanol, okay. You can see sometimes when you punch some of the samples, they come out with a little bit of edge, you know, curvature to them, or as we call them, a little bit of lip effect, okay. You can use the bottom of your finger to sort of flatten it out, right? And give it that last little bit of final polishing that you need for about 20 seconds on each side. And I find that that, that helps really, really good in terms of finishing the sample, especially for the next part that we're going to be doing for this process. Now, you can put your sample straight into an iron mill here and prepare it, but we're talking about a day or two of iron milling, okay? So to add further help to this, preparation method, okay, we're going to do a process called dimple grinding, okay? Now, dimple grinding is based on a, on a magnetic turntable, right, this one here, okay? And the mount, the sample will be mounted here fixed. Usually, the sample is fixed on a, on a tiny little puck, and it's centered using a, a tiny little microscope that comes with the machine, okay? Because we want to target the center of the sample, right? If, if we target an edge of the sample, we might be outside of the, bound, the boundary for, uh, for a good TM observation. So you got to keep those things in mind, right? So the cam rotates orthogonal to, 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 the, to, the, to the turntable, right? It has an inbuilt micrometer and a dial to set up how much we want to remove, right? So the depth of the dimple will allow us to know how thin the sample is, right, in that cross section so that we know, hey, we need to stop here. We need to go into our iron milling to further finish it, right? Because we want we want electrode transparency around that, right? And the whole point here of dimple grinding is we want to make sure that we thin the sample enough that we can pass it on to a, a, an iron mill to make a hole, right? And in theory, the hole around that will be electron transparent, right? The edges around the hole, right? sure that you check your progress as you go. So what's going to happen is the sample is going to be put right through those grinding and grinding steps again, right? But the point of contact between the grinding wheel and the disc will be the axis of rotation of the disc, right? So again, that's why the sample has to be centered, right? Conventional grinding and polishing, that's what we're going to go through, right? But in this case, we're going to use diamond, uh, diamond paste. Usually, you can buy the diamond paste um, according to the application for dimple grinding, right? The lubricant that we're going to use is kerosene. I, I recommend applying it with a syringe because we're not, we don't want to add too much, right? So a drop or two. And what's going to happen is we're going to add our grinding wheel, which is usually made out of brass, right up here, right? Our sample sits here. We lower the cam. 
we use our lever here to lower down the depth and this does measure how much we want to remove the micrometer is on the other side of this cam here right we lower it down we measure how much we want to remove we add using a toothpick or dimple grinding compounds or a diamond compound usually you want to start off with maybe 25 micron diamond suspension right to remove about maybe 25 microns from the surface it's ideal sometimes to remove material from both ends but if your work might be a little clumsy becomes extremely hard to handle on the second dimple. So just for now, focus on dimpling the just the top surface, right? And we want to remove just about 500 microns, right? I don't want to emphasize too much on the on the on the diamond compound because it depends on what you have, right? So some diamond compounds can be 25 microns, then you have 10, 15, 5, and then the final polishing, which is um, you know, submicron, which you use with a different wheel which is a buffing wheel, okay? So keep that in mind. Um, but a total depth of about 50 microns should be good. It, you can go further if you're feeling comfortable with the removal rate, right? But again, like I said, the sample becomes extremely hard to handle after that second dimple. I usually do the two dimples because I wanna make sure that when I go into the next step, the iron milling, you know, I'm only spending about an hour or two in there, I don't want I don't want to exceed the four or five hour mark in the in the iron mill. It is very important as well to make sure that you clean your sample, like the other rules that I mentioned in the conventional grinding and polishing, because you wanna this is extremely important here. You don't want to cross contaminate. Okay, if you cross contaminate, you're gonna make a hole in your sample during the dimple grinding steps, and the downside of this dimple grinding processes, you can only do one sample at a time, right? Imagine how it is, you have to prepare five, six samples, and all of a sudden you only have, you know, now you're down to six because you made a hole on each one of them. Don't be discouraged though. If you feel adventurous and your hole is not too large, you can put it in the iron mill, right? Play around with the angles of your guns, mill a little bit around those ends of those holes, and you can get lucky enough to find a good interest area, right? Now it's again to reduce the time, right? Like I said, dimpling the other side, but recommended for those beginners, just dimple the first side. You can go deeper on, on if you're just doing one end, right? So maybe instead of 70 or 80 microns of dimpling, you know, maybe you can now after dimpling right you're going to consider putting it in the iron mill right because you want that extra help you want to make that hole right so what's an iron mill right so there's two types of iron mills usually or the ways that we can prepare samples in the iron mills is using a cold stage or a normal stage usually we use the cold stage for samples that are you know sensitive to uh to iron beams or sensitive to that sort of environment that we're going to put it through Right, so aluminum is a good is a good example of that. So we want to cool down the stage to you know to about 160, which is the liquid nitrogen sort of temperature, right? And then we can begin the mill, the milling process, right? We have a microscope here to allow us to see where how our milling goes. We have a dual angle gun, right? So this gun's here can target both the top and the bottom, right? And then obviously you can control the current. And obviously you want to do this under vacuum, right? Ioning is a sputtering process and neutral atoms and ions from a cathode trench on the disc at an angle, right? And as a result, atoms of the sample are milled away, right? This system here has a laser and a sensor at the top of the bottom, right? So that when we make a hole, the actual miller will stop. Right, the iron mill will stop. The interest area is the hole, as I mentioned earlier. Right, the nature of the sample and the of the iron mill, right, are completely dependent, right, on what type of sample you. Have, right, 
if you know what you're doing, you'll probably do a little bit of background research on what sort of parameters you need, right? In this case, I'm talking about aluminum, right? So four plus or minus four angle on each gun, right? Single sided. So I would aim them both to the top first, right? And after an hour at 4.5 kV, I would flip the guns, you know, and on that hour, I will come and check it to make sure that the removal rate is good, that I haven't already made a huge hole, right? Because sometimes in the dimple process, it's hard to keep track of, of, of a measurement, right? How deep did you go, right? Because my commoners tend to be a little, you know, especially uh, sensitive ones like these cam micrometers, right? But anyways, runs can take anywhere from four to 16 hours, right? Again, it all depends on that side, on the depth of that dimple that you made, right? And, those, and the material, right? If you have something that's extremely hard, something that you know is gonna take a very, very long time, beware, you're gonna be milling for 13, 14, even up to 16 hours, okay? And I recommend a, polish, a final polishing or a final milling, milling step of, of at a very low KV, you know? Target the same area, maybe switch your angles a little bit to something lower, right? Or if you wanna target the middle a little bit more, okay? For maybe five to ten minutes, recommended. Okay. Couple of extra points to finish up this webinar. Okay, there's so many other ways to prepare samples. These were just a few. Okay, make sure track of your work. Right after you learn a new way of preparing a sample, practice and keep good notation of that process of that work. Because a big thing that I found is sometimes you can come up with your own tips and your own ideas. And next thing you know, you have your own, you know, tips to share, like I shared with you today. Also, storing samples is extremely important, right? Desiccator, desiccator cabinets, transportation tools like SEM boxes, or just anything that can help you transport your samples because you want to make sure that you don't that you keep your sample away from, from all these air contaminants and hand contaminants, okay? Now, do not forget to label your samples as well. Something I should have mentioned earlier. Extremely important because worst case scenario is you're preparing a sample for a technician and you have six samples in there and you didn't label any of them. The technician is what's what, where, where is everything, okay? So make sure that you label very well, right? And every sample is different, right? Sometimes finding out the perfect way to prepare a sample is just sometimes a matter of luck, okay? Especially in wet polishing, okay? Preparing those samples in an angle is extremely, extremely tricky. And sometimes finding the right angle for that right application is extremely, extremely hard. So just keep that in mind. I wanna show you guys that picture here of an APT sample. Give a little shout out to Brian, okay? The little light speckle is the interest area that he later on puts on the APT, right? To study atoms, okay? Again, I wanna thank everyone, and I hope you enjoyed this presentation. <clears throat> and if you have any other questions, please refer to my email okay, below, just to make sure I can answer any questions, or if you, if you just wanna know anything about sample prep or anything about the CCM, please feel free. Now, here's some references that I, that I use for today's webinar. And again, I wanna to apologize to all of the biology people I didn't include a lot of biological preparation because I haven't done much of it. Now, the Royal Microscopy Society has a very good link that you can refer to down here uh, for preparing biological sample. And again, thank you everyone for your time. Great, thanks, Joyner. Um, there's some questions that came in and if anyone else has any questions um, that they'd like to get answered, please put them in the chat. So the first question, um, what techniques do you use for microscopy of polymers and polymer composites? Um, and this is specifically for SEM sample prep. Well, if you wanna look at the cross section, as I mentioned earlier, you can use conventional grinding and polishing if you can be, you know, careful by it using one of these Right. Let's say your, uh, let's say your silicon wafer, your semiconductor is thin. Right. You can mount multiple of them like this and look at the cross section. Right. You can also do the CP polishing here. Right. 
do that. But also, let's say you, I recommend using mostly the wedge polishing unit, right? Because in that way, you can get a nice flat surface, right? But if you're mounting those samples, just remember you have to coat them, okay? And you'll probably have to add a little bit of nickel paint, right? So usually, as you can see here, I added here, right? Let's say you had a wafer here, that polymer, what you can do is the same way that I did here is you just mount it on the stub, add a little bit of paint, right, on each corner to sort of hold the sample down, and then add a coating. That's one way that you can do that. Um, if you want to, let's say you wanted to look at a cross section of the of the semiconductor, you might have to go to FIB to get something really well for that. So hopefully that answers your question. I think you need to be a little bit more specific because in SEM you can you can pretty much look at it in cross section or just planar view. So hopefully that answers the question. Okay, you mentioned coding, and the next question is actually about coding. Okay. Great. So what is the typical thickness of coating? So let's say gold palladium alloy. How do you measure the thickness? That's a that's a great question. And again, um, you have to have a thickness monitor, as I mentioned earlier, right? So if you don't have a thickness monitor, you'll probably have to sort of do a little bit of experimentation. So what happens here on one of our coders actually? So this coder here, we actually don't have a thickness monitor. Um, so one of our colleagues, Andy, what he did is he went through a series of coding times. So you can see our timer here on the side. And he sort of measured uh, how thick that thickness was based on that time, right? So you can use that to measure how thick a coding can be if you don't have a thickness monitor. But I would say anything from, I would say maybe five microns to 10 microns coding for each. So let's say if you wanted to do SEM work, 10 microns of carbon or gold would be good. If you're doing backscatter, again, very light, seven, seven to five microns of carbon would be good. Then for TEM, we're talking about, you know, nothing more than five, five microns coding. Oh, sorry, five nanometers. Everything in nanometers. Oh, yes. Okay. About five nanometers. Yeah. Okay, um, we will ask one last question and then the other questions that we didn't get to, we will put in a separate um, video on the YouTube channel. So the questions will get answered and if there's more that you think of in the next um, five or 10 minutes, please again, just put them in the chat and we'll make sure to answer them. So last question, more on coatings. Um, so metal coatings is often used in SEM sample preparation. Do we make sure that the sample metal, metal interface isn't changing when using these metals? And does it affect spectroscopy at all in the SEM, so like EDX? Yeah, of course. So you you know that if you're adding a sort of coating like gold or palladium or platinum or silver, you have to make sure that you anticipate that you'll be that element for EDS, of course. You're going to be exciting those, those x-rays, right? when you start to look at the sample in SEM, you can't help it, right? Um, they, those have, those uh, coding, that thin coding layer has to follow those laws, right? Those Bryce laws that, that we that have in place. But in terms of making sure what coding to use, to summarize into that question correctly is, ask what coding you can use rather than having a, a variety of codings available. So let's say you're gonna be Looking at EDS, I recommend just coding with carbon, okay? Carbon is at everything, so you sort of don't run into that problem where you're like, oh, okay, now I have to worry about the silver popping up on my EDS results, right? By adding carbon, you know you're just, you're anticipating the carbon to be there already. So I think the good background here for that is, if you're not too sure about what coding parameter to go to, carbon is usually the, the go-to um, element. 